handsome one, isn't he? I lost my first boy. Little black-haired beauty. He was a fighter, too. Tried to beat the fever that took him. Forgive me. That scene, more than any other scene, probably speaks to the complexity of who Cersei is as, as a person and as a character, where she can be telling the story and actually eliciting the sympathy from you while you're watching the story. You're like, wait a minute, you know, and then you can forget what it was she participated in that led her to be in this room with this crippled boy in a coma telling the story in the first place. She's always manipulative. At the same time, I believe her that she is, she was distraught at the death of her son, and you can be two things at once, and I think that's one of the things that makes her a compelling character, is she's very complicated. Such a little thing. Bird without feathers. She um, is inscrutable, you know, you never know what she's thinking, or what her motives are. And I don't know that it was so much of a manipulation. Yeah, I think there was, there was some underhanded stuff happening there, and some, obviously, some lying. But there was like a great moment there, a humanizing moment for the character. I pray to the mother every morning and night that she return your child to you. Perhaps this time she'll listen. Why'd you read so much? My brother has a sword, and I have my mind. And a mind needs books like a sword needs a whetstone. The way Tyrion talks about it, which makes sense, is that his older brother Jamie is a great sword fighter. And Jamie is famous, you know, he's he's probably one of the most talented knights in the Seven Kingdoms. And because of that, he's brought glory to the Lannister house. Tyrion obviously can't claim any of that. He's never going to win a tournament. He's never going to do anything particularly impressive physically. That's not a gift he has. But what he does have is a really powerful brain. He's very smart. And so rather than trying to be something that he isn't, he chooses to um, try to accentuate what he does have and, and make his brain that much more powerful. Tyrion is an intellectual and reads voraciously. And he likes to see what the world has to offer. And there's kind of nothing more amazing in this world than a very high wall of ice built by people thousands of years ago. He's kind of less interested in the intrigues and the courtly comings and goings than he is in, in things that he probably sees as having more ultimate value. The greatest structure ever built, the intrepid men of the Night's Watch, the wintry abode of the White Walkers. There's great honor serving in the Night's Watch. The Starks have manned the wall for thousands of years. Ned is not an emotionally demonstrative person. He isn't somebody who tells his children that he loves them on a regular basis, even though he does. And he'd think he loves John, even though he probably says it even less often to John because there's so few opportunities where that kind of confession is appropriate. You might not have my name. I have my blood. This is the only viable place for, for John to go, and that's, that's what it's about for Ned. It really is about what he perceives as best for John, even though he knows full well that the Night's Watch is no picnic. John's grown up with the stories about the Night's Watch and their heroism and um, this kind of chivalric idea in his mind that they are the defenders of the North and these noble warriors protecting those in the South from monsters and, and so forth. The reality of the Night's Watch, especially now, is that they've fallen upon hard times. So Jon Snow has a kind of outdated notion of what life at the Wall is really like. The Night's Watch protects the realm. Ah, yes, yes. Against grumpkins and snarks and all the other monsters your wetness warned you about. You're a smart boy. You don't believe that nonsense. 